So we've actually accomplished a lot at this point. We now know under the assumption that S0 was sent, we understand how UI is distributed. Okay? But there's still a lot more to do. We still need to analyze VI under the assumption that S0 was transmitted. We also need to understand how YI is distributed under the assumption that S0 was transmitted. If you're wondering what YI is, YI is just the noise part on the sine branches. So the analysis so far has just been on the cosine branches. After we mix and integrate, we have a random component come through due to the noise coming into the system, and that component is what we've been calling XI. On the sine branches, which there are two of, after the noise comes in, gets mixed and integrated, we have a noise term again. On those branches, we're calling the noise YI, now, what you'll see, obviously, is that XI and YI end up being the same thing, but it's just a notation thing on how we're breaking the problem down. So we still really have two more pieces to do under the assumption that S0 was sent. And then we still also need to do the whole analysis to figure out how this system works when S1 is sent. So we really have to repeat all that again for S1. Now, we're not going to do all the details here. You basically mimic the approach that we've done to do the first two pieces of the analysis on these remaining six pieces of the analysis. And we're just going to summarize these final results on the next couple slides. Okay, So under the assumption that S0 was sent, here is a summary of what we have. And what we have is that U0 looks like this. There's a deterministic part, alpha 0 times cosine of phi, so that's something we derived plus a noise term, x0. And we know the properties of x0. We know that it's zero mean, and we also know that it has a variance of n naught norm squared of w0 over 2. We know everything we want to know about u1. We also know that it is equal to just noise. Remember we did that, we found out that the deterministic part was zero, so we just had a noise term. So u1 is equal to just noise, this noise is zero mean and has a variance of n naught norm squared of w1 over 2. So this is really something that we did in the previous charts. We actually worked all that out. This is something we kind of just know because we know that the noise isn't going to vary. This is something we completely skipped, but if you go through the analysis, it turns out being minus alpha 0 sine of phi plus y0. This is something we skipped, but we know the noise is going to be this variance with norm squared of w0. And similarly, this is something we skipped. We know it's just going to be a noise term because under the assumption that S0 of t was sent, we know that the branches that are processing S1 are going to have a deterministic part of 0 come out with just noise. That noise is what we call y1, and it has the exact same statistical properties as x1 and y0 and x0. In fact, all of these are independent, and they're all zero mean, and they all have a variance given by this equation. The only thing that impacts the variance on a signal-by-signal -signal basis is as I'm mixing up the receiver, I'm using a different baseband shape, W sub I. So as I mix with this different shape, that changes the variance. But other than that, everything is all the same. Also, keep in mind what this alpha zero represents. That represents the dot product between M zero and W0. Here is a summary of the decision statistics on the condition that S1 of t was sent. So this is something that we didn't do any of the details of in these charts, but you can kind of see how it's going to work out here. It should be somewhat intuitive. When I'm sending S1 of t, the top two branches should just have noise output. There should be no deterministic part. The deterministic part should just be zero, and that's what we see. When S1 of t is sent, my top two branches don't have a mean. They have a mean of zero, and all they have are noise. When S1 of t is sent, the bottom two branches do have a mean. This branch has a mean of alpha 1 cosine phi. This branch has a mean of minus alpha 1 sine of phi, and they also have noise terms added onto them, obviously. Alpha 1 is the dot product between M1 and W1, so it's very consistent with our definition for alpha 0. And then, again, the noise terms, they're all zero mean, they're all independent, and their variance is given by this equation. 
On the top two branches, the variance is identical because I'm mixing with W0 in both of those. The variance on the bottom branches is identical because I'm mixing with the same W1 in both cases. So we now know everything we would want to know about the decision statistics U0, V0, U1, V1 in both the case where S1 of T is sent and the case when S0 of T is sent. Let's go ahead and do one little thing to wrap up this video. Let's simplify product expressions. So if the correlators I'm using are optimum, meaning that W of 0 equals M of 0, and W of 1 equals M of 1, and this is almost always what we assume, we just started with the W of 0 and W of 1 to give us a mechanism to look at mismatch if we wanted. But if they're optimum and everything's matched up like it should, then alpha of 0, which by definition is this, is actually equal to M0 dotted with M0, which is by definition the norm squared of M0, which by definition is the energy of 0. So we're calling E of 0 the energy of M0 of T. Same thing happens for alpha 1. Okay? So alpha 1 turns into the energy of M1 of T, which we call E sub 1. And then I can also sim um, simplify my variance equations. The variance of 0, so the sigma sub i squared, turns into just n naught e0 over 2. And sigma 1 squared turns into n naught e1 over 2. So now we know the statistics of all these decision um, statistics. We know how they're distributed. Now we can go ahead and start asking ourselves, what is the optimum decision rule? Now that I know how they're distributed statistically, how do I contrive a decision rule to make the best decision possible? And that's what we'll do in the next section of the charts.